craft beer, I would say local. Man, just local. Local. You know, a lot of brewers are really in touch with uh, the local community and local ingredients and, and try to build up the, the hop growing scene in Virginia. One word that comes to mind for Virginia craft beer, uh, I'd say growing. Growth. Growing. Explosion. It's come a long way in the past couple of years. Um, it seems like every time you turn around there's another brewery opening up with uh, better and better beers. The one word I think of when I think of Virginia craft beer is community. It's a sense of community. Community. Community, uh, for sure. You know, I can sit at the front door of either of our establishments and watch people park their cars, and they get out of their cars and they all have a smile on their face. They're ready to go embrace their friends and, and, and their families in an environment that's, that's very uh, supportive of that. I'd say, when I think about Virginia craft beer, innovation is the one word that comes to mind. I'm gonna say camaraderie. Pushing the envelope. Challenge. Great quality. Fresh. Craft. Diversity. Variety. Honesty. Fun. Passion. Beer is just, it, it's like great food, great wine, great people. It's, it's what makes life enjoyable and interesting. Virginia craft beer, one word, great. In 2013, the number of craft breweries in Virginia rose to its highest level since before Prohibition at 77. Also in 2013, Virginia had its best showing at the Great American Beer Festival with a record 14 awards, which included four gold medals. Virginia actually came in fourth in medal count this year, which is, uh, I think, very impressive. Uh, we came in fourth after uh, Oregon, California, and Colorado. And those three states are really uh, some, of the, some of the best craft beer states in the country. So for Virginia to come in fourth is something that we can all be very proud of. According to recent numbers published by the Virginia Craft Brewers Guild, Virginia craft brewery revenues climbed to $623 million in 2013, while supporting over 8,100 jobs throughout the state. In many ways, craft brewing is the poster child for what every politician talks about every single day. They're all small businesses, uh, with the exception of a few, they're all under 25 employees. You know, we've got the hospitality, the tourists, the manufacturing base, and uh, they're jobs that cannot be outsourced. You can't outsource my job. While craft beer as a whole is on the rise in the U.S. with the number of breweries rising to over 3,000 for the first time in history, a few of Virginia's numbers really stand out. According to the Guild, Virginia's craft breweries jumped a whopping 75 percent from 2011 to 2013. And according to the Brewers Association, a national lobby for craft beer, Virginia's production growth from 2012 to 2013 was 52 percent compared with a national average of 18 percent. Both in terms of speed of growth and then what some of the breweries in Virginia have been able to do in just the past few years on the national and you know, both, both that and the international scene is pretty incredible. As craft beer fans ourselves, my crew spent three months touring the state and talking to experts, brewers, and beer fans to get a sense of what was behind the craft beer movement in Virginia. And what we found was a story of local innovation, collaboration, and community. And in talking with those in the know, most pointed to Richmond in the early 1990s as the place where it all began. In the 1990s, there was a, an initial wave of microbrewing. In the old days uh, of early Virginia beer, I guess, we came on the scene shortly after Dominion Brewing Company, and Rich Brow had been open a while. Um, in the larger Virginia scene, you had Old Dominion and Potomac, some of these brewers that really aren't around anymore. Back then, it was like, Yingling Black and Tan at a store was kind of like, you know, crafty -er than anything else you could find. Um, but then when Legend opened up, uh, again, it was kind of a, a, the light bulb went off and you're like, wow, there's, there's a really a great um, new thing out there called craft beer. They, they really kind of paved the way for, for craft beer in, in Virginia, in the Richmond area especially. In 1994, Tom Martin, the son of a prominent Budweiser brewer, decided to start a craft production brewery, the first of its kind in Virginia since Prohibition, and chose Richmond, Virginia as its location. I think Tom was really the first person uh, 
to open a brewery with the idea of distributing his products you know, locally and um, you know, with the idea that we're going to start really small and try and own our own little area. And there's a great story he tells about being um, on Southside Richmond in an area they call Manchester. He walked onto this particular piece of property. Um, downstairs was a sheet metal shop and you know, the deck wasn't out there. It was just a big hill. And there are like, you know, piles of trash, garbage, etc. And uh, he stood on that hill and overlooked the city. And you could see the, uh, the uh, Richmond skyline. It's a very dramatic skyline from that point of view. You know, saw that view and he's like, it has to be a great place for a brew pub with a big deck. And there's plenty of room downstairs for a commercial brewery. We thought it was plenty of room downstairs. And um, he was sold on it immediately. He just loved it. I mean, it's, it's really... It's almost like the destination picked him. In 1999, several years after Legend had gotten their start, a young Mark Thompson founded a small production brewery in Charlottesville, Virginia. The brewery was named after an affluent Charlottesville neighborhood that was called Star Hill. Uh, you know, so Star Hill's story is we, uh, so I grew up here in Charlottesville, went to Western Almar High School, biology degree at James Madison. I landed in Portland, Oregon in 1991. Uh, where I took my first brewing job in 1992 in Portland, Oregon, when the craft was just exploding in the Northwest, in Seattle, Portland, San Francisco. I would always come back for, uh, for Christmas break and whatnot to Charlottesville, and people didn't really understand craft beer. Had the opportunity to uh, take over Blue Ridge Brewing Company, which is on uh, West Main Street in downtown Charlottesville. It was the first brew pub in the state of Virginia. It was run by uh, Paul and Box Summers, the grandchildren of uh, the grandchildren of William Faulkner, the famous author that lived here in Charlottesville. Craft beer was not in the vernacular of Charlottesville and in kind of Virginia at the time. No, I think that Virginia beer had a, had a great start with Star Hill. I mean, Mark's, um, Mark's done a marvelous job. Um, and, you know, those guys have been making great beer for a long time. You know, we set about making uh, Amber Ale. It was the only beer we made. It was in draft. I used the Model T Ford analogy. You could buy any flavor of Star Hill you wanted as long as it was black or, you know, as long as it was Amber Ale. In the early days, Star Hill and Legend were really the only two production breweries. There were a couple brew pubs probably scattered around, but... Uh... When Tom originally started Legend Brewing Company, we needed to um, get our beer out there, and Tom was very concerned that um, the larger uh, distributors would take it on, not really do it justice, or even in the state of Virginia, they don't really have to do much with it at all. Once they've sold your product, it's theirs. You have very little control. We, my wife started this wholesale, wholesaling company, Star Beverage Company. So we go in, her and I, to see the, uh, the ABC agent to get her license for the wholesaler company. It's on her due date with our second child. She's nine months pregnant. And I'm sitting here, and she's sitting here. And, and the ABC agent, just in this quizzical way, he just couldn't understand what we were trying to do. He's like, let me get this straight. You're going to make beer. She's going to buy a van, and then she's going to drive this van around town and sell this beer? We're like, yes, sir, that's what we're going to do. You could see him about to laugh off his bar stool. It's like, that will never work. He signed the documents like, good luck, kids, you know? So in, in the old days, it was like two guys and one in a beat-up pick, pickup truck that we called the dog house, and one in uh, an old an old Dodge van that we called the Millennium Falcon because usually you had to kick it to get it to do what you wanted it to do. I actually started working for those guys as a delivery driver and I showed up every morning, loaded up a truck and delivered beer to Williamsburg and Norfolk and Virginia Beach and Hampton and so on. Their story, you know, Tom would have to, he would get a call from uh, say a restaurant or whatever and drop everything, go deliver some kegs of beer. You were on the ground the whole time you were right in, in the trenches, is what I always say. You know, you were right there. You know, one day you're filling out tax forms in here for the feds, and the next day you're out, you know, shoveling beer into somebody's back room or fixing somebody's tap problem. But now craft is, is it's, you can't, the, you know, the dam is cracked and like the water's coming down and you can't stop the momentum, which is craft beer. As legend in Star Hill continued to grow, the craft brewery count in Virginia stayed stagnant for the next 15 or so years as some breweries came online and others closed their doors. As numbers from the Craft Brewers Guild show, craft beer slowly gained momentum in the late 2000s as mainstay breweries such as Connor and Aleworks started down in the southeastern part of the state, Devil's Backbone and Wild Wolf opened their doors in the western part of the state, Port City and Mad Fox began brewing in the northern part of the state, and Hardywood and Midnight opened in Richmond.
And while this next wave of craft brewing was taking shape all over the state, an effort started by a tiny group of brewers was about to change the landscape of Virginia beer forever. In doing research, I think one of the biggest challenges to craft brewing in Virginia was the legal structure. When you look at states like California, Colorado, Vermont, places that have a lot more breweries per capita, the regulations are far more liberal. They can sell their beer at farmer's markets, just like wineries can in Virginia. They can distribute their own beer. They can do a lot of things that Virginia breweries still cannot do. The reasons why Virginia has lagged a little bit behind is, is, is that the laws that were written for our industry treated craft beer no differently than they would the big brewery in Williamsburg or the big brewery up in Elkton, as, we, as if we were just large domestic breweries. So in 2010, there were about 40, 42 breweries and uh, brew pubs. There were enough people with enough interest that you could do something together as a team. And they approached the state legislators, et cetera, and they, uh, there was a significant proposal to change an element of the three-tier system. You know, we, we worked uh, quite a bit on, on getting uh, Senate Bill 604 passed, which allowed us to serve glasses of beer. And, uh, much like wineries could, we well, still can, go buy a bottle of wine, go sit outside and, and, and drink it. We kind of piggybacked off what they had already done. They laid the groundwork. We just kind of said, how about us? And so the General Assembly uh, approved and Governor McDonald signed uh, a bill that allowed brewers to sell pints and to fill growlers on site. And what that did was that allowed a whole sector of uh, brewing to come on and actually flourish. 604 enabled the manufacturers, the brewers, to be able to have some significant role in growing their own brand through on-site sales. And uh, it's a win-win for everybody. Just being able to have people come in here and enjoy a beer at the place it was made is an amazing way to introduce someone to your products. Um, our business here in the tasting room doubled overnight by being able to offer pints uh, here in the tasting room. I think it's helped a lot of small breweries get off the ground that probably would not have been able to. Um, the retail side of this industry can be somewhat profitable the wholesale side of this industry, it's, it's all a matter of um, quantity. Um, we had initially looked at maybe opening a little bit bigger, um, but we started with the three barrel. Uh, this size brewery is not financially sustainable without a tap room. Uh, if we sent all this out to a distribution, we'd be sucking wind. And you really have to get to a point where you're putting enough quantity out because you really aren't, you're not getting the margins you would get if you're selling it in your own establishment. We had looked at, you know, basically doing tastings and growlers and praying that was going to keep us in business. Um, frankly, I think we would have just kind of lost money for a year and hoped that was good enough to expand, which it wouldn't have been. So I think this allowed a lot of really good beers and good breweries to get off the ground that otherwise may have had a difficult time. I think other, other people that have, have always dreamed of starting a brewery just like we did uh, saw that as an opportunity to uh, strike while the iron was hot. and. Um, since that bill passed, we've had quite a few breweries open in Virginia. SB 604 definitely changed the game, I think, for everybody. But it, well, the, the best part about it for us is it made us possible. SB, SB 604 was the catalyst for everything that we did. Without that, without that we would have never even had the discussion. Um, so it was absolutely instrumental to us uh, existing at all. And now, thanks to that bill and the success of the tap room and the fact that we were profitable in our first year, uh, we use those numbers to borrow for the production brewery that we opened. So for us to have had to, if we would have had to start straight into distribution, it would have been a much larger system, and and none of us had the capital to be able to do that. The fact that we have six packs on the shelf next week is a direct result of SB 604. Uh, ultimately, we're seeing that uh, Senate Bill 604 that allowed this uh, new regulation is achieving everything that it set out to achieve. And there was a recent roundtable with Julia Hers of the uh, Craft Brewers Association, the Brewers Association, based in Boulder, Colorado. Um, she said within the next three to five years, um, we could look at a goal of 150 brewers. We think within the next two to three years, we could have 150 breweries in Virginia.
SB604 has been the catalyst for a lot of the exponential growth in Virginia breweries over the last several years, giving aspiring brewers a chance from a financial standpoint to start small and build a following. The reaction of the more established breweries in Virginia has been one of respect and community as they volunteer advice and try to help the startups to overcome the challenges that come with the territory. In addition, most brewers welcome the new competition as a spark for creativity and innovation as the marketplace gets more and more crowded and as local beer fans become more adventurous. We have a variety of, uh, I would say, inspirations really of, about where, uh, about how the idea of a beer comes together and uh, where we want to come, uh, where we want it to go and so on. Uh, and uh, the inspirations can be a variety of things. It could be somebody else's beer. Or, or a characteristic in that beer, and I think, oh wow, that's really good. Uh, how did they do that? Let's see if we can do something like that. It's just like cooking at home, where you get an idea of, of the meal you want to have with the ingredients that you have, and try to put together a, a proper meal, or in this case, a proper beer. That's how it starts. It's like, wouldn't it be cool if you could get Chimay Blue in a rum barrel? What would that beer taste like? You're picking the best ingredients you can possible and trying to fuse them together to make the best beer possible to get the concept across that you're going for. Put the ingredients together, you know, design the, the brewing process in a way that extracts these exact aromas and flavor characteristics. Stirring the mash and calibrating and calculating exactly what temperature of water that you want, exact consistency of barley versus water to get exactly where you want, which can completely change the beer. You know, we, we spend a lot of time and effort in getting the color, getting the, the aroma, the flavor profile that that we're going for. It's just finding a way to brew a beer that translate that translates that inspiration into something that people can taste in the glass. In talking to some brewers, they were very eager to elaborate on how some of their best beers had been inspired. Adam Shiflett of Three Brothers Brewing in Harrisonburg gave us the rundown of how their rum double came about. So the rum double, the idea there, um, <clears throat> Lee and Doug down at Apocalypse, uh, they use a Belgian strain for Lustful Maiden, their double. So we got a pitch of that yeast from them, and what we noticed was that uh, it created like this slight kind of banana note at the temperatures that we were fermenting at when we were kind of experimenting with it. and. Uh, the I just ended up having this idea. Uh, we already had like this caramelly kind of note already, and then you had this like a little bit banana note, and I just had this idea of bananas fostering, uh, which is delicious. And uh, I was like, you know, it'd be great if we could take that and kind of incorporate that into a rum barrel aged beer and create like a bananas foster type esque, you know, flavor. And uh, I think it turned out really well. It's a really short duration age um, because you just want to keep that rum subtle. Greg from Adroit Theory gave us the rundown on the inspiration for a new collaboration beer that they were brewing with Three Notched Brewing in Charlottesville, Virginia. So Bloody Mary beer, that uh, if you love Bloody Marys or even like Bloody Marys, you're gonna love this beer. Uh, the idea came about our owner likes to, when he makes Bloody Marys, he likes to take a bottle of India Brown Ale, mix it in with the, the mixture to just round out the notes. And so the idea was, can we do the reverse with a brown nut beer and give it the hint of Bloody Mary on an Imperial Brown, so you know I, that's how half our ideas come up. Is one of us enjoys making something completely unrelated to actual making beer, and we want to bring that into the beer. Um, so, 30 pounds of habaneros, horseradish, celery, salt, tomatoes, all went into the mash. Well, the habaneros went into the boil, but at the end of the boil, because we don't want to kill people's tongues, but we want to have that spice kick, you know. And local honey from the Charlottesville area went in there too to sweeten it a little bit whole brew house at Three Notch smelled like a Bloody Mary. No matter where you work, people were amazed the whole day long. Mike Killer at Strange Ways talked about how hearing a particular song can inspire certain flavor profiles. Uh, Mixolydian Rag we brewed, uh, it, it's based on Jerry Garcia's guitar playing and Eyes of the World. And so, you know, I'm thinking earthy and light and, you know, kind of airy, but, you know, but with a little bit of a dark edge to it and, you know, smoke came to mind so you know I put together a beer that I thought would taste like smoke and airy and ethereal and you know you, you know what I'm saying so I'm trying to find out you know that, that make those tastes uh, reach out to those same adjectives you know what I'm saying. 
And finally, in talking to Port City, Bill Butcher discussed using an ingredient that would not typically be associated with beer in their Revival Stout. We partnered up with a local Virginia oyster company and they bring us 3,000 freshly shucked Chesapeake Bay oysters every time we brew this, this stout. Uh, we put the shells in the water to extract calcium content to harden up the water. Uh, and then we throw the oysters into the last 20 minutes of the boil. Uh, and our Revival Stout gets a nice briny character. It's got a very smooth uh, mouthfeel that it gets from the oysters. And people really like that beer. And it does great at the oyster houses across uh, the state of Virginia. Inspiration can come from anywhere. But in talking with brewers, the thing that inspired them most was the local Virginia farmers and agriculture movement. They were very intent on imparting a local terroir or a taste of place into their beers to give it a unique and distinctly local flavor. I think uh, as far as the created, the more creative beers that we've, that we've made have really been inspired by the community around us. I'm using locally grown Virginia products such as barley, hops, uh, pumpkins, herbs, spices. What's available, what's seasonal, what's coming around, what's new that we haven't used yet. Those are the types of things that get me excited. Uh, we've been able to find uh, a wheat grower on the northern neck of Virginia in Heathsville and he's growing a good quantity of very high quality uh, red winter wheat and that's what we use in the base of our Optimal Wit beer, which is our best-selling beer. You want to use ingredients grown on the farm to supplement some of the beers that you have and then create actual terroir into beer. We do try to get some uh, watermelons when they're local. Peach farmers and strawberry farmers. Um, so collaborating with a, a lot of these um, people in our community as um, farmers and, and coffee roasters and woodworkers has uh, really allowed us to create a, a synergy, I guess you could say. Perhaps one of the best known examples of synergy between a brewery and its local farmers is a beer brewed by Hardywood Park craft brewery in Richmond, Virginia. Our good friends at Hardywood have done a fantastic job of championing local ingredients. So we're all familiar with gingerbread stout and that's made with local honey and local ginger that they paired up with farmers to do. So early on we were talking with Brian, our head brewer, about um, what we were going to do for our first winter beer. The, the initial um, sort of idea started churning with a, uh, a guy named Bill Cox that owns a farm called Castlemont Farms. Uh, came by with a big stock of ginger and we immediately thought here's a guy that we would love to work with his passion about his product is very much in line with ours about beer and uh, he said it's his baby Hawaiian ginger it has this really unique flavor and so he sliced us off some we all sat around and tried it but at that point didn't really know what we'd do with it and uh, I think shortly after Eric ran into um, uh, someone who makes their own honey less than a week later met um, Hannah Huber, who is now um, married to Cy Bearer of Bearer Farms, and she introduced us to um, Bearer Farms Honey. Uh, we started thinking about it, and, and uh, I think Eric said, hey, let's do a gingerbread stout. It was one of those wake up in the middle of the night sort of things that um, I thought, why don't we try to make a beer that tastes like gingerbread cookies? So um, we sort of adapted a, a recipe that we had um, that we've been brewing at home that was always popular among our friends, a uh, vanilla porter, and uh, adapted that into this um, big imperial uh, milk stout that we added uh, all these ingredients to and created gingerbread stout. And we gave it our best go and it worked really, really well. And, um, you know, when we first brewed it, we thought, hey, this is good. And a lot of people seemed to like it, but uh, didn't quite know the you know, fanaticism that would come along with it. While Virginia brewers continue to find ways to incorporate local terroir into their beer through local agriculture partners, Virginia's hops and barley scenes are just starting to pick up. There's growing demand for local hops and barley, and one of the challenges that the farmers in Virginia are trying to figure out is how to plant them, where to plant them, what strains are going to do best in the state of Virginia, and this is a long-term process. So growing hops in Virginia does present some challenges. Um, it's hotter and more humid than the most ideal growing climate. Just like grapes, you know, certain grapes grow well in Virginia and a lot do not. Uh, just the, the climate itself, it's, it's different than what grows out in Oregon, uh, Washington State. It, it's just a, 
it's humid here. It's a different different atmosphere. There's a lot of moisture. There's a lot of pressure from um, like powdery and downy mildew and some other diseases as well as some new invasive insects that we've dealt with in other crops that we're not quite sure if it's going to be a challenge with our hops production yet. There's only a, a handful that, that grow well here. You can grow a lot of different varieties, but they've got to be able to grow well and then you also have to be able to market that. So you've got to add those two together to make, make it work. So like Cascades do very well, Nuggets do well. We've had success with Chinook um, and some limited su success with Columbus as well. We're growing Cascade, we're growing Nugget, and we're growing Zeus. That way we have uh, three different types of hops. One that's a super high alpha and uh, one that's kind of a high alpha and has a very strong flavor, which is Nugget. And then Cascade, which is an all-purpose hop, not quite as bitter, uh, a lot more citrusy flavor in it. And a, a majority of beers that craft brewers brew today have cascade in them. You get a lot more unique uh, kind of tones that come off it because every farm's a little different. We're all using different nutrients and things like that. Virginia grown hops definitely have a different flavor and it's kind of like in the sense with grapes and, and wines. Um, there's subtle differences and uh, it's definitely brought out in the beers as you use Virginia hops versus Oregon hops versus New York hops versus North Carolina hops. It's all, there's subtle differences but they're different. With our stuff I get more like grassy like herbal, grassy, you can really taste the leaf. In talking to experts, the local barley scene is where the local hop scene was five years ago, meaning that there is still room for improvement. However, efforts by local farmers coupled by the push from Virginia's new farm breweries have revived the once dwindling art of growing and malting barley. So local barley is really exciting because that's going to be, in our opinion, over the next five years, one of the most exciting things that's happening in craft beer. Yeah, a lot of people ask for barley in the state. They're really interested in it for brewing, not for grain. Um, so they're curious why there's not more of it. And the biggest thing with barley that I'm seeing is that we need more local maltsters. Um, barley for brewing is a bit different. Um, a lot of it's just due to the fact that the varieties that are developed for brewing with different traits have just been refined in other areas of the country, so they're not as well adapted to the conditions we have here. So we've started a program where we have uh, six row barley that we're growing out in the, uh, on the farm. Traditionally, brewers use two row. Um, I've brewed some beers with six row with some good success. Um, so we're gonna partner up with Copper Fox that makes Wasserman's whiskey. They have their own floor malting facility. We're gonna take the six row that we grow here, send it to them, They'll bring it back and then we'll brew a beer that we call SB430 with it. So it, to our mind, will be one of the very first in quite a while that's made with barley grown on the same place where the beer is brewed. So once we start getting some maltsters out here, expect to see a lot more local, very local beers coming out of the area. I, I think within 10 years, we'll be able to brew a beer entirely of local ingredients, which is very difficult to do right now. What will the next 20 years of Virginia beer look like? It's hard to say, but one thing is clear. With the passion and commitment of local breweries in developing quality and innovative beers, Virginia beer fans have a lot to look forward to. It's interesting. Um, there are all kinds of, of prognostications that will reach a critical mass. How many breweries is enough breweries? So we've gone from, uh, if you look at the Brewers Association charts, prior to Prohibition, they were roughly a little less than uh, couple thousand breweries, it dipped to almost zero during Prohibition and then back up. So now we're at 3,000 plus breweries in America now with another thousand in planning. The, you know, the grocery stores aren't getting any bigger. The taps aren't getting that many more on premise. So at some point, uh, something's got to give. I think when you look at the fact that we started out and when we were opening in 2011, Virginia ranked 37th in breweries per capita. The market share for craft beer, for Virginia craft beer in Virginia is still 2%. I think that leaves a tremendous amount of potential. And it seems to me that all of the breweries that have opened since we've opened and even you know, the ones that uh, had been thriving before are all of the similar mindset where the rising tide floats all boats and they see how much vast amount of potential is there and we're all more or less working together towards similar goals. It's, it's only going to grow. It, the future of craft, Virginia craft beer, it's, it's only going to grow. I still meet people who think Hardywood and Legend are the only breweries in, in Richmond or Virginia. And when they start reading about, you know, Adroit Theory or, you know, Port City or Beach Brewing, they're like, wow, you know, Virginia really has a ton of craft breweries. 
I think they're really, Virginia's really going to start to stand out among the other states around the country as, as you know, a, a beer destination. Um, and I think more and more other regions across the country are going to start paying attention to what's going on in Virginia. I think that's what the future of Virginia holds. All right, all right, all right, quiet on the set. The, the talent is working now. It can be in the blooper reel. Yeah, oh, that's what I'm saying. Is this better? <laughs> Sorry. Sean's awesome, isn't he? Love that guy. Yeah. And he's so good looking, too. Uh, with my Russian River shirt on. Plenty the elder, man. I think it is the first recorded hangover in the United States. <laughs> but, uh, hold on. I, for years, I've always carried these stickers around for just this occasion. Where I would kill everyone in this room for one drop of sweet beer. And where I can uh, cover up his logo with, with, uh, with Star Hill. Right. Future, future. <laughs> so, <laughs> cut. Cut. cut that and try again. With our, well, that, go back on. Yeah. Well, edit. Uh, I think. Um, Oh, yeah. They keep like flying into my you face. Had a spider dangling on I was, I like, felt like something was on me, and I, I was like, gone. I don't want to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> don't look at the camera. We always age a third to a half of it in barrels of some sort. We've got a saison right now, aging in rum, aqua v, white wine, red wine, and I think even a possibly even a bourbon barrel. So. Um, we really are wood crazy. <laughs> hey, don't 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 twist that one, okay? <laughs> Can't make this stuff up. So. <laughs> I'd say the most interesting craft beer name for Virginia from a Virginia brewery is probably Wood Booger from Strange Ways. The, the, the weirdest name would have to be Wood Booger. I, I got to give it to Strange Ways. I think Wood Booger is about as um, different as it gets. I don't know, but I think they would have picked one of our beers. <laughs> uh, uh, Strange Ways has a Wood Booger. Most interesting name. I think that right now it's Wood Booger. It's Wood Booger. It's probably Strange Ways Wood Booger. Wood Booger? Oh, uh, yes, of course. <laughs>